any conversation of neuroscience has to mention Santiago Ramon y Cajal, the man who is considered the father of neuroscience almost entirely because of his art. We didn't really have a sense of neurons as discrete and wildly varied entities. Yeah, and he's really the father of neuroanatomy. And what I think is so exciting about Cajal, and we've talked about this, is that he didn't actually look in the microscope and draw what he saw. In today's parlance, he was making stuff up. He put down what he knew he was seeing. He, he was top down. He was not microscope up. There's a drawing of a neuron that Cajal did that looks like a penguin. <laughs> and that, I think, is a joke. He looked at these sections, and I can tell you from looking at these sections that if you look at these sections, you see nothing. You see, it's a disaster. There is no section of gold G stain material that looks as beautiful as Cajal's drawings because Cajal's drawings were made up. They were synthesized in his brain of the best that he saw from thousands of slides and thousands of hours of looking at slides. Um, and so in that situation, in fact, art was better than drawing the actual details of the Golgi stains from any one section. He did us a better service by being artistic about it. Is that, are we talking about, uh, about Plato's notion of the noble lie? Maybe. And maybe that's what art does for us. The visual system is very um, forgiving of a lot of physical impossibilities. And I just posted on Twitter with the Monet where the shadow is backwards. He has this bird on a fence and the bird is here and then the shadow is in the other orientation. And no one notices it. No one cares because that violation of physics never happens. So you don't have to be on guard against it. How does art affect you? Because I know you're a very, very artistic woman and very much involved in the arts and your mommy makes art and you're from an artsy fartsy family. I'm in a very arty room. <laughs> art takes me away from the present and, and it, it really is transporting for me. Picasso's Guernica is an example of something that's highly transportive. I mean, I've never actually seen the piece, but just in the pictures I've seen of it, you get a sense of the chaos and the misery and the, the distorted reality. It is a still image that puts me in the same place as war movies do, getting all brain buddy about it. One of the really remarkable lessons that we learned from art is how easily brains can be fooled. Trump loy. Trump loy, Trump loy, right. Boy just means fool the eye in French. It's a very old trick, but even just normal paintings that give us a sense of perspective, three dimensions, in two dimensions. And this is despite the fact that our brains are, we have whole, you know, the whole V1 area that is just designed to analyze visual stuff and we can get fooled all the time. And these are yeah. complex, sophisticated systems that we rely on to live. We are very forgiving um, of artistic violations of physics. We take the 3D-ness out of a 2D image, which is just, we're just making up stuff. It's not there. And part of it is also, I think, that uh, we, we talked about a few weeks ago about the brain's tendency to predict, because that's why uh, films work. Still images at 24 frames, frames a second look like continuous motion because our brains fill in the gaps. We see a hand moving that way and we're predicting what its path is going to be. There's one sculpture that uh, you can you can see. It's just a, a steady sculpture. It's not even frames per second. Incredible sculpture of horses flying through water. And there's a copy of it in Paris and there's a copy of it, I believe, in Dallas. I don't know if you've ever seen this. It's a fountain. It's a fountain, right. Much has been written about and is easily observable about the psycholo psychological and psychiatric state of artists that is reflected in their art. Aronis Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights springs swiftly to mind as an example of someone's work that is very reflective of, in some way, the state of their brain, certainly the state of their consciousness. This incredible series from the Art Institute. Here's a bunch 
bunch of self-portraits before the stroke. Okay, now here are self-portraits after the stroke. Huh. When you look at Vincent van Gogh's bedroom, it's not an accurate representation of the proportions of the bedroom. We know how the bedroom measured, and it's not. On the other hand, it gives you the feeling for the bedroom. Because, you know, if you think about it, our visual field, whatever you look at, that's where all the detail is. Essentially, we have this bird's eye view where everything out in here is very detailed and big and everything out here fades and becomes smaller. So if I look at something, it gets disproportionately larger in my interpretation because that's how the visual system is built. That is more accurate to what we perceive than is, say, a photograph, <laughs> which has has the same number of pixels all the way along. My mom would like to say something. Mom? I like to do portraits, and I find that I look at a person, and there must be five or six people in this one person. I could, I could do the depth of the person, or I can do the, the life of the person, or I could do the sadness in the person. And I have to immediately feel what they really are. And I have to take that, all those people and put them together into one image of what the real person is as well as I can do it. I think you're saying that you, you, you're looking at the various aspects of the individual and translating that, trying to find, create a work that will communicate the whole of the individual in this very tiny little you know, sculpture or picture. Either the whole or the essence. I'm trying to get inside. But you do it through, through things in their face. Yes. My mom and I were also looking at a bunch of pictures by Goya, and he did it differently. So you could tell exactly what he thought of the person he was painting by the trappings that he put around this person, how he clothed them and what background he made. There were people that he painted that he found ridiculous and he shows that. And then there were people that he painted that he liked and he shows that too. Your mom is talking about creating a work of art that gives a sense of the essence of the person. You weren't drawing them, you were sculpting them. That's right, but I mean, the same, it's the same idea. Wait, so you were, during the Watergate hearings, live sculpting the characters? Live from TV, yes. What in the world possessed you to do it? It was very exciting. I think I had a nine inch TV. I had sculpture stands on wheels, so, and lots of clay. So whoever was talking, I could, draw them. And I love to draw people. I think people are fascinating. And these were people who were not phony at the time. They were really fighting for their beliefs. They were vital. And I was fascinated. Mind blown. <laughs> I've never heard of anyone. He's mind blown. <laughs> All right. So Peggy, what's our takeaway here? Let's be very scientific about this. The most Interesting thing in science is ignorance, not knowledge. Let's say to you viewers, help us by exploring our ignorance. Um, tell us what moves you in art, what makes you want to do art, what makes you want to have art. Is it good to feel or is it good just to feel beauty? Well, I think that that's a fine question with which to leave our audience. And thank you so much for taking time away from spending time with your mom. But your mom completely and totally rocked. My guess is that she will get a bunch of new followers for, for Jane S. Mason on Instagram. Thanks, Peggy. 